It's the real news. I'm Aaron Metter. If you protested Donald Trump on Inauguration Day or were even curious about doing so, the odds are high that the government now wants your personal internet information. Trump's Justice Department has asked for the browsing data of all 1.3 million people who visited an anti-Trump website before his inauguration. The site, disruptj20.org, was used to coordinate civil disobedience actions the day Trump was sworn in. More than 200 protesters faced charges for taking part. Joining me is Alfredo Lopez, co-director of May 1st People Link, a web service for the progressive community. Alfredo, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Ann. So if you could tell us about this case, uh, DreamHost, the server company, hosted the Disrupt J20 website. And now the government has asked DreamHost for the records of 1.3 million people who visited that site uh, leading up to the Inauguration Day protests. Uh, right. So it starts in January, shortly after the inauguration. The Department of Justice got uh, uh, sought and received a, uh, and served a search warrant on DreamHost for some basic information about this website. This website was a site uh, that is used, the, one of the primary sites being used to organize the inauguration protests. And so, uh, you know, as we've since learned, at least some of us, those of us who are in New York knew a long time ago, but uh, the country has since learned, uh, Donald Trump t t tends to take this stuff very personally. And uh, people who protested his inauguration became the targets of this uh, kind of intense in, in investigation. Now, it's important to remember that DreamHost, as a provider, cooperates with the government routinely on the rendering of information on its servers. So it is not in any way, shape, or form strange that it immediately gave up the owners of this website, uh, the managers, the registration, addresses connected with the website, etc., all of which stem from the original search warrant. However, when the government got this information, it then expanded the search warrant shortly after. It's what's called requests. In other words, the way search warrants work on the internet is they, they get a warrant for you through an affidavit that they present to the court about what the case is about. The affidavit isn't public. The warrant is. And the warrant is expandable through a series of what they call requests. It's a laughing term, laughable term, but that's what it is. So the requests specify what you got to do to comply with the warrant. In this case, they made a series of additional requests. They asked for information from the databases on the website, which is, you know, when you fill out those little forms and say, yeah, I want you to contact me in the future. That's one of the, that's a, that goes on to a database. They would get that information, so your address, your email, et cetera. And then they made a final request. They wanted the IP addresses of everyone who ever visited the site. That request is unprecedented in the history of the Internet or the United States of America. It is an incredibly blanket request. And what it basically says is anybody who visits the site, they will now have your information as part of a case and a criminal investigation. Um, and, you know, that's what the IP, just so people, people might not know what an IP address is. So uh, just, uh, you know, to contextualize, when you sign on to the Internet to begin a browsing or email session, your provider, your the people who put you on online, assign you a series of numbers, uh, you know, a series of uh, uh, multi-digit numbers, um, which are called an IP address. That's kind of a little badge that you carry around during your entire session. So uh, that's the, uh, uh, the, the number by which you're known on the Internet during this session. And in tracing that number, they can determine every place you visited, what you did, and by getting in touch with your initial provider, they can get all kinds of information about you, including who, they are, who you are. So that one, uh, you know, there, there are 1.3 million IP addresses logged. Uh, that is an incredible amount of information, an unprecedented intrusion uh, by the uh, Department of Justice. And that's where DreamHost uh, uh, stopped. That's where it held the line. 
They said, we'll give you everything else, but you cannot take those IP addresses. And that's what the, the legal uh, issue is about, which is going to court tomorrow. Right. So there's a hearing on Friday. Now, forgive me, Alfredo, if this question is naive, but have IP addresses been used before by law enforcement uh, in a court of law to build cases? Absolutely. And um, it's a very, a very effective piece of information. Um, a lot of people think you can be anonymous. And you actually can, using certain methods, you can have an anonymous internet session. But most people don't. I, for example, do not. And I'm an internet professional. I go on the internet. I know that my IP address can be traced all over the place. And in the case of, uh, of criminal activities, uh, you know, uh, real genuine criminal activities, or uh, some political cases, uh, demonstration organizers, et cetera, they use the IP address to trace where people go. But what we've never seen, you see, th there's a difference. It's bad enough if they're investigating me for organizing something, say May 1st People Link, and they're using my IP address for that. But when they take the IP address of everyone who visits our website as part of a criminal investigation, that's the difference between an overreaching government and a police state. Hmm. Uh, and that's where we have to draw the line. That's where DreamHost is drawing the line. Right. Certainly, there have been other cases of government requests for online information, but none, I imagine, have been this expansive covering this many people. That's right. And uh, or as blanket. Usually, and you know, I'm not, you know, uh, we, I screamed and yelled in columns, comments and, and speeches about Barack Obama's White House and it's intrusive. He was the master of intrusion as far as the internet is concerned. Uh, they have all kinds of ways in which they violated the First and Fourth Amendment, and there have been many legal cases and struggles around that. Things have gotten worse from that point of view. But we've never seen them open up a funnel like this and say everyone... See, here's the thing, Aaron, to, to understand. You know, you can uh, block a movement in many ways, including... Uh, uh, going after its leadership or, or uh, tracing uh, activities or trying to get information on conversations, etc. But when you take everyone's identity who is visiting a website, you're crushing a movement. You have the ability to stop a movement in its tracks. You can now identify everyone in that movement. You can begin harassing them. You can be blocking them. You can begin tracing them. We're not saying that the government actually is doing that in this case. What we're saying is that the government has the potential to do it and it is seeking the ability to do it, whether or not it uses that ability. Hmm. Alfredo, so finally, you have, as you mentioned, this court hearing tomorrow. Where do you see this case going? Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so, uh, you know, it's not, it's tough for me. I've never been able to guess legal stuff. Um, I, my hunch is that there's going to be argument on both sides. There's going to be clarification of positions. Uh, there are going to be presentations of motions. And probably, I doubt profoundly that we're going to get a, uh, um, a decision f uh, from the courts on, on, uh, on, on this particular search warrant. Keep in mind that the, the, the portion of the search warrant that's being challenged is the uh, blanket collection of IP addresses. Uh, so... Uh, you know, that particular uh, uh, part of the, of the search warrant is a legally complicated issue. It hasn't been dealt with legally before. So I, I imagine that the courts are not going to immediately make a decision on it. I doubt very much that we'll get a decision. But we will get clarification of positions on both, on both sides, and we'll be able to get a handle on whether or not the uh, Department of Justice uh, really is serious about pursuing this. Because if it is, then our movement has to uh, pay a lot of attention to this particular issue. Right. And very quickly, given this case, if you're someone who is visiting a anti-Trump or anti-government or you know, dissident website, should you be concerned about the government one day seeking your private internet record? Oh, yeah, sure. You should always be you should always be concerned about the government. That's what, <laughs> that, should be the, that should be something you carry around with you all the time. 
However, it's really important that people not curtail their movement activities or their web browsing because they're afraid. Uh, you see, uh, here's one of the things about this. If you get 1.3 million IP addresses, even though a lot of those are repeated, et cetera, you're not going to analyze and identify all 1.3 million. So what the government is doing is not really an investigative uh, measure. What it's doing is intimidating people. It's trying to provoke interviews like this where people then will come out and say, oh, my God, based on what this fellow said, uh, I shouldn't be visiting those websites. Yeah. Uh, and it's really important that not only do we visit them, but we increase visits to them. Um, and and just take on, you know, it, it, the way to protect the right is to exercise it. And right. you have to exercise your right to visit these things. Otherwise, we close down the movement. And then these, I mean, you know, we all know what, what's in the White House and the government right now. You don't want to leave a country in their hands. So, you know, there has to be a constant uh, uh, pressure on our part and constant organization on our part. Alfredo Lopez, co-director of May 1st People Link. Thanks very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.